In the name of Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. The Bible says, Then Jesus went to a place called Gethsemane. Oil press. That's where we find Jesus today. You might recall as we've been going through the gospel according to St. Matthew, where do we find Jesus? He had just, you know, hours before been up in the upper room celebrating the Passovers, gathering his disciples together to commemorate yet again when the angel of death passed over the chosen people of God when they were held in bondage and slavery there in Egypt land so many centuries before and God had commanded people every year, remember this time, remember this date, commemorate and celebrate how God delivered you with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm from bondage and led you to the promised land. Fulfilling the promise that God had given Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, God would give him a threefold promise, land, nation and blessing. There was a geographic spot on the earth. You and I today call that the nation of Israel. God said, I'm going to give you this spot of, of ground, this piece of realty. It's going to belong to you. It's going to belong to your descendants. It will be a nation. And from that nation, all people will be blessed. Abraham had one son, Isaac, who had two sons, Jacob and Esau, who had 12 sons. Remember the 12 sons of Jacob? Can anybody name the 12 sons of Jacob? Raise your hand. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, Benjamin. You should know that if you had a pastor like I did who kept us three years in confirmation class, you would know that. The 12 tribes of Israel. It's all of this that they were celebrating on Monday, Thursday, when Christ instituted the Lord's Supper, the very thing that you and I will celebrate today, in which Christ Jesus himself said, this is my body, this is my blood, that promise given to you, to me, to Christians of all time, carried down even to the present day when in just a few short minutes, sermon's going to be short, you and I will receive the true body and blood of Christ. And now Christ takes his disciples out of the upper room and leads them to the oil press. You and I call that Gethsemane. That's literally what the word Gethsemane means, oil press. Think about that, oil press. Why was it called an oil press? Because it happened to be located on the Mount of Olives, the Mount of Olives so-called because the Mount of Olives was covered with olive trees. Yeah, it was the Mount of Olives because there were olive trees. There were olive groves there, not olive orchards, okay? Think about that. Friends and fellow Christians, I have to tell you, when I read this part of Matthew's gospel and started thinking about it during the week, the more I thought, the more I pondered, the more I ruminated on this section of Matthew's gospel. I can't help but believe that the location we find Jesus in today is not by coincidence. It's not as though, you know, hey, there's a nice little garden over here. Let's just go over there and sit down. It's like when you get to town and you, you're riding around and you got a little bit of time to kill. Hey, let's, let's pull into Hardee's and have a hamburger. Let's go to Walmart and walk around. Let's find a city park and sit and relax and take our time. That's not what was happening here. Friends, I have to believe that Jesus Christ chose this particular spot to emphasize, to illustrate, to give a living picture of his mission and ministry here on earth. Consider, how many of you remember the flood, Noah's flood? Nobody's here is that old, right? 
But, but you read about it, didn't you? Yeah, Noah, God comes to him. I'm going to flood the whole earth. You need to build an ark. It takes Noah 120 years to build that ark. He puts it all together according to his God-given plans. He puts two of every kind of creature there aboard the ark, which makes you and me wonder what? Why didn't Noah swat the two mosquitoes and step on the two cockroaches, right? And he's on the ark. You know, the floods come, the waters come up out of the deep, they rain pour down from the sky, and Noah is aboard the ark for one year, one month, and 17 days. You can do the timeline there in the Bible. Over a year, Noah rides aboard the ark, protected and provided by God. And finally, Noah begins to wonder. I wonder if there's any dry land out there. And what does he do? He takes, first of all, he takes a raven and sends the raven out, and the raven never comes back. And then Noah takes a dove, and he goes to that one window in the ark. There was a window, all right? It didn't have glass in it. It had a wooden shutter. And he opens that shutter up and he lets that dove go and the dove goes and flies over the face of the earth. The Bible says he flies to and fro and he comes back after a period of time having found no rest for his foot. And Noah waits seven days and lets the same dove go again, and the dove goes and flies over the surface of the earth and then returns to the ark, and what does he have in his beak? An olive branch, an olive branch, which from that time to this day is the symbol of peace. If you're having an argument with somebody, a disagreement, I mean, over whatever, you can have disagreements on, you know, whether the golf ball went in the hole or not, or whether it went off into the rough and it counts. I mean, you can have an argument or a disagreement over anything, but finally, you want to get over it, you want to get beyond it, and what do you do? You extend an olive branch. Olive. The symbol of peace the symbol of reconciliation. Could this be the message that Jesus is giving his disciples and giving you and me today that he goes to the Mount of Olives, demonstrating that his mission and ministry, his journey to the cross has begun, and by him being nailed onto the cross, shedding his innocent blood, that peace and reconciliation would once again be established between God and man. Oil press. Can't you just picture the scene? All those olive trees growing there on the Mount of Olives, and when harvest time comes, the pickers go out, and they gather all those olives together in buckets and in baskets, and they carry them down to the press, and there those olives are pressed. And what does a pressed olive produce? Olive oil. Yet another symbol of comfort. Yet another symbol of healing. We read through it just a few short moments ago, the 23rd Psalm, the best-known psalm out of all 150 psalms. What does David say? Thou anointest my head with oil. And David was not referring to a quart of 10W40. Olive oil, commonly used there in biblical times to soothe, to comfort. Think of this. I've told you before, I'm telling you again right now. Jesus, Jesus is the given name of Jesus. When Jesus was born, they gave him the name Jesus, which literally means, nobody knows? You know it. Savior, all right, Savior. But we call him Jesus Christ. Christ was not his last name. It's not like there was a group of people named Christ. You know, Bob Christ, Sue Christ, Cindy Christ. No! Christ is a title. And it literally means the anointed one. 
So the anointed one, Jesus, goes to the Mount of Olives, a place that is symbolized by trees that symbolize peace, and he gathers his disciples there at the olive press where olive oil is made. Can you see the symbolism that Jesus is sharing with his people? Can you see the message that he is giving you and me today? Reconciliation, reconciliation, forgiveness, life, peace, comfort. How many times have we been in a moment of turmoil, a moment of tri trial, a moment of anxiety, and what do we do? We get on our knees, we fold our hands, and we say, God, comfort me. When a family member loses a loved one, what do we say to them? May God comfort you. It's in this place of comfort that Christ begins his journey to the cross. And yet, we are compelled to think of the Old Testament prophecy from Isaiah, chapter 53, verse 5. That'd be a neat little thing for you to read this afternoon. Read through Isaiah, chapter 53. Isaiah! Chapter 53, Isaiah chapter 53, it's called the Messianic chapter because it describes in detail exactly what the Messiah would be doing. And one of the key verses, verse 5, he was bruised for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. How do you get oil out of an olive? You squeeze it, you press it, you crush it. Could this be yet another message that Jesus is giving you and me? You will have peace with God. You will be reconciled to God. All of your sins will be washed away. You will triumph over death and the grave. You will be given an eternal mansion in paradise, not because you have earned it or you have deserved it, but totally and completely through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ upon the cross, the cross on which he will be crushed. And standing there next to that oil press, Jesus tells his disciples, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to the point of death. Have you ever been depressed? Don't have to raise your hands. Have you ever been down? Have you ever been despondent? Have you ever been so sorrowful that you wished you would just go ahead and die? That's how Jesus feels. To you and me, that's a great comfort. No matter how distressed we are, no matter how disappointed we might be, no matter how despondent we might feel when we go to Christ in prayer, we're speaking to someone who has been there. Jesus doesn't hear our prayers and say, man, I don't know what you're talking about. I've never been that down. Christ has been there. He has been down. He has been despondent, so sorrowful, so filled with grief and anguish that he says, you know, I feel like I should just go ahead and die. Why? Why would Jesus be so filled with sorrow? You know, for the longest time, really until this past week, when I really sat down and got into the text, for the longest time growing up, you know, I thought Jesus is sorrowful, he's despondent because he knows what's in front of him, right? 
He knows that he's going to stand before Pilate. He knows he's going to stand before the Sanhedrin. He knows he's going to be slapped and beaten and spat upon and brutalized and bruised. He knows the crown of thorns is coming. He knows those rusty iron nails are going to be driven through his holy sacred flesh and into the wood of the cross. He knows that he will be up there for six hours suffering pain and agony and humiliation. And who would look forward to that? How many of you like to go to the dentist? Raise your hand. Not me. Now, I'm not saying anything bad about dentists. Dentists are good people, right? But whenever I have a dental appointment, I worry about that for days. And I have to psych myself up. You're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. Even when I'm driving there to the dentist, uh, you're, you're going to be okay. He's not going to hurt you, at least not on purpose. And I'm sitting there in the chair, and he comes with the great big happy shot. And I always tell him, give me two or three of those. He says, you won't be able to feel your face. I say, I don't care, man. I don't care if I don't feel my face for a week. I don't want to fill that drill, right? Oh, boy, I don't want to go. And I kind of thought, you know, isn't that kind of an analogy to Christ in the cross? He knows all of this is in front of him. And who looks forward to pain and humiliation and agony? You know, that's where we get the word excruciating. If you have excruciating pain, literally, the word excruciating comes from two Latin words, literally meaning out of crucifixion. That's what it means. That's the kind of pain you had on the cross. But I sat and thought about this text all week long. And it occurred to me that Christ isn't sorrowful about the pain he's going to endure. He's not sorrowful. It's not as though he's feeling sorry for himself that he will be insulted and brutalized. Why me? He's sorrowful for the reason that he has to go to the cross. God had made a perfect world. Read Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2, Genesis chapter 3. God had made an incredibly beautiful and perfect world where everything was just right. And then Satan came and tempted Adam and Eve. And they ate of the forbidden fruit. And casting all of humanity and all of creation into sin, they had children, and Cain killed Abel. And population grew, and we read in the Old Testament that Lamech bragged to his two wives about the murder that he had just committed in revenge for an insult that had been given to him, the world becoming so incredibly wicked and heinous and against the will and way of God that God finally repented. He had made man and covered the entire world with a global flood, totally and completely obliterating all of humankind except for Noah. And Mrs. Noah, and their three sons, and their three wives. And finally, after a year, and one month, and 17 days, in riding aboard that ark, God delivers them on Mount Ararat. And what does Noah do? He gets out of the boat, and he ties one on. Noah gets drunk the very moment he gets off the boat. And we read throughout the Old Testament of time and time and time again when mankind rebelled against God and was disobedient to God's will and way. Think about King Ahab murdering Naboth so that he could get his vineyard. 
Think about the prostitute in the book of Judges, the concubine who was brutally raped during the night and then torn to pieces the next day, each piece being mailed throughout the nation of Israel. Time and time and time again, we can read of horrible, heinous, ungodly things happening there in human history recorded in the Scriptures. And as a side note, I've had plenty of people tell me, how can you believe in a God who records all of these things in the Bible? Look at the wickedness, the evilness, man's inhumanity to man. And I point out to them, these are not recorded as an example to follow. These are recorded in the Bible to show us mankind's need for salvation. This shows why Jesus had to come. And it's with all these thoughts in mind that Jesus is sorrowful even to the point of death. And not only for those things that had happened, but for all those things that would happen in the future. Wars and chaos and calamity, murder, rape, theft, deceit, dishonesty, adultery, big sins and little sins that would happen up to this moment in time today. And sins that will keep happening until the end of time. This is the weight that crushed Jesus Christ. This is what compelled him to be sorrowful even to the point of death. And yet, what does Jesus pray? Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Not what I will, but thy will be done. You might remember a couple of weeks ago, I brought that up during one of the sermons that I preached, you know, the cup of wrath that God would, Jesus Christ would drink to the very dregs. Remember that? That he would drink to the dregs the wrath of God. This is what Christ is looking forward to. This is what he sees in his future, drinking to the very dregs the wrath of God upon the cross to the point that he would cry out from the cross, quoting Psalm 22, verse 1, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And yet it's at this point in time that Christ carries those sins to the cross so that his righteous blood would totally and completely eradicate those transgressions from the mind of God. Friends, I want you to know that. I keep saying it, and I want you to believe it. I want you to rejoice in that. Cling to it with bulldog tenacity when you stand before God and he opens that great big book of life and he looks for your name there in that book of life. Yeah, here it is. Here's the name. Here's all the transgressions that that individual committed. And you know what will be there? The word forgiven. The wrath of God was placed upon Jesus Christ upon the cross so that the final words of Jesus, it is finished. It is accomplished. I did what I came to do. With all that in mind, my friends, is it possible that it's coincidental that Jesus went to the Mount of Olives and prayed to his Father in heaven there at the oil press, that place you and I call Gethsemane? Is this just a coincidence? I don't think so. I simply don't think so. Perhaps it's with this in mind that the Holy Spirit inspired the Apostle Paul 
to write to his Christian friends in the city of Rome, chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore, being justified with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, we now have peace with God. Peace, which is symbolized by the olive branch. Friends and fellow Christians, that's something to think about. And with that I say, Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in the one true faith, which is found in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.